Hi, Carlo. Hi, Rob. How are you doing? Um, you know, this, if I disregard the environments, I'm doing, I'm doing fine. Yeah, if you disregard the environment you're in, which is, I should say, Tel Aviv in Israel. And in fact, we should warn people that you may have to, you may be interrupted by a, um, uh, like a rocket alarm, right? You've been hearing some of those lately, and at that point, you have to, I gather, uh, your your you, you, yeah, your uh, wife and dog uh, have to seek shelter, and maybe you too. I don't know how that works. But. Uh, well, my, my wife's not going to take it well if I'm not going to go into the shelter. We haven't we haven't sh like you know old buildings that were built after the Gulf War, 19, in 1991 in Israel have an, an, uh, one room that is is the designated shelter, which is built as a shelter. So it's kind of nice because you don't have to run out or anywhere like that. You just, uh, uh, in my case, it's actually where I see my patients. So it's very comfortable. And, uh, Good we to have, have a, nothing like a comfortable bomb shelter, I've always found. Nothing like a very comfortable bomb shelter that's close, well uh, stocked. and. Uh, okay. So let me set the stage for conversation. First of all, you are Carlo Stranger. Uh, as some viewers may remember, because you've been on Blogging Heads TV before, you are um, in the psychology department at Tel Aviv University, uh, and a psychiatrist, and an author of, I think most recently, the book, uh, The Fear of Insignificance. And, uh, and you write uh, a blog for the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, and in case anyone has just slept through the last few weeks of Middle Eastern history, let me just quickly say, of course, uh, you know, some weeks ago, three Israeli teenagers were abducted by Palestinians. We now know they were killed almost immediately. Um, Bibi Netanyahu uh, blamed Hamas for it. I'm not sure he's provided any evidence for that, but in any event, he initiated a, a crackdown on Hamas uh, meanwhile, some missiles were coming over from Gaza into Israel. Hamas was not at that point claiming responsibility for them, but that, but that part of the thing has escalated to a point where now lots of missiles are coming over. I mean, not, not I guess, reaching re Tel Aviv yet, but... but uh, uh, actually, uh, the, 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 uh, a few minutes ago, one was in intercepted by the Iron Dome. It's just in, above Tel Aviv. Oh, really? Just, oh. Ago. Yeah. So that's yeah. a longer-range missile. Coming in from Gaza? Yeah, it's not the first time. In the last round, uh, they were already they were already coming. Uh, they had, we know we had to have missiles that re that reach that can reach Tel Aviv. So uh, that's not no. So so that's escalated, and now there's t uh, and, and there's been a lot of uh, bombing of Gaza by Israel. Uh, some Palestinians have died as a result of that. Um, and there's talk of a possible ground invasion of Gaza. Meanwhile, of course, uh, back to the other dimension of this that kind of I guess started it. Um, some Israeli Jews, in apparent retaliation for the kidnapping and murder of the uh, Israeli teenagers, uh, kidnapped and killed a uh, Palestinian teenager, um, and I, and that's been a, had a big impact. I know on 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 thinking and talking in Israel. Maybe I should start out by asking you, since you are a psychiatrist. At the risk of asking actually, you to, I'm actually a clinical psychologist. In you're clinical psychologist. Okay, so you cannot, you cannot. I'm not send you, I, can, I can't send you drug prescriptions. You can't send me drugs. That's... Well, in that case, I have no further use for you. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but uh, at the risk of asking you to overgeneralize, is there anything you would say about kind of the the state of mind of Israelis right now? Well, what is, uh, there is one, uh, the point is exactly that it is not possible to generalize because, um, you know, within Israeli parlance, uh, people often speak half-jokingly about the state of Israel and the state of Tel Aviv. Um, there is... Uh, as, this, as two separate things, you mean? That's two, as two very different cultural and political mindsets. Tel Aviv being relatively secular, cosmopolitan, and certainly as distinguished from Jerusalem, which has become increasingly religious over the years. Exactly. Uh, and then, uh, by and large, uh, what happened was that during those three weeks, two and a half weeks, in which uh, 
ostensibly the IDF was looking for those uh, teenagers. The truth is that they knew from uh, the, the onset that they were dead. The, the government knew that with pretty the, the high confidence, but, because, but did not really uh, By the time the full tape uh, that reached the police uh, was disclosed to the public, uh, you can hear it. It's actually rather chilling because you hear uh, the uh, Palestinians uh, tell uh, the teenagers, put your head down and, you know, they scream with laughter and you hear the shots. They actually killed them immediately. Um, and uh, here, I think basically what happened is that the government put some fog over that to have a pretext in, particularly in, in, internationally speaking, to crack down on Hamas. Um, and uh, now what happened was that during that time, it was kind of, there was enormous pressure was exerted to, um, to, to on the citizens of Tel Aviv, quote unquote, not to voice any criticism, for example, not to say anything about the fact that those three teenagers uh, live in settlements that we think shouldn't be there to begin with, that the idea of uh, teenagers taking hitching hikes uh, or hitching rides uh, at night in the middle of the uh, occupied territories is preposterous to begin with. You, you couldn't say that, okay, because it, said, it meant that you're uh, unpatriotic, etc., etc., and you know that's what from the from, from from the United States. You know there are certain moments where you're not allowed because when our boys are fighting, you're not allowed to. Voice. After nine eleven, you briefly were not, basically not not allowed to criticize President Bush. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, exactly. So it's you know it's it's, it's an internet. It's very it's a well researched phenomenon. It's uh, um, so th that's why it's so difficult to generalize. On the one hand, uh, you have a sizable part of the population. Uh, that quite unfortunately is now moving into a state of mind where it's just basically seeking revenge from uh, against Arabs. So that's kind of a collectivized uh, form of hatred. You see the same thing, vice versa, uh, uh, from uh, Palestinians towards Israelis, particularly after that uh, horrible kidnapping, and as it now turns out, uh, the teenager was first numbed and then burned alive. Uh, and the, the the names of the people who, were, who did it haven't been uh, uh, the, there was a gag order, but we know they're right wing extremist youths, and they have been arrested. No, they have been arrested. Yeah. And uh, I think that for the time being, it's being uh, trying to get to the if there is an organization behind it, but probably there isn't actually because. Uh, so you have you have uh, I, can, I I now just came back from uh, Haaretz, the uh, newspaper for which I write columns and and do blog, um, organized a, a peace conference. It's been, it was supposed, it was, it's a thing that's been in the planning for more than half a year. And I can, to have, to give you a micro reflection of what it means to be here right now, one of the most important points was that many Palestinians were supposed to appear during this conference. And in the last days, one by one, they canceled. So basically it became a peace conference without Palestinians. I don't blame them because I think that they would probably have been considered as traitors uh, vis -a -vis by their own constituencies if they come and talk to the Jews uh, while uh, Gaza is being bombed, never mind that uh, Tel Aviv and Sderot, etc. Are, are being bombed as well. Um, so, and we still, and Haaretz still decided to uh, to go ahead with the conference and make a clear statement that even even under these conditions, and that's the state of Tel Aviv, we have to think clearly. We must not just you know seek revenge. We have to think about constructive solutions. We have to move the country in a direction which becomes livable. Um. And, you know, this comes in the wake of the failure of the latest attempt to get a two-state 
solution, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess in a rational world, it might provoke uh, reconsideration of that whole process with a renewed sense of urgency on both sides. But I, but I assume that's not actually happening um, and, and I say that because this does seem to point to the, you know, the potential for, you know, something pretty catastrophic. I don't know. Certainly a third intifada. The second one, after all, happened in, in the wake of failed uh, peace talks. Um, and there's been some talk now for, for months, if not years, that, that there's a sense that it's kind of building, the pressure is building. There's going to be a third intifada. And we know the second one was much more violent than the first. And so, I, you know, you, you you might hope that, well, this increases the chances for a two-state solution somehow, but I assume that would be hoping too much in your view. Well, you say in a rational world, but, uh, you know, I'm, I happen to know, uh, I hope that our viewers know that uh, you have written quite a bit about evolutionary psychology, so... Uh, you know very well. I know we don't live in a rational world, yes. Uh, you know very well that we live in a world of uh, uh, um, that is anything but rational. Um, the level of hatred and distrust is just shooting through the roof, mutually. Um, let me also say something. I think um, Carrie's attempts were well-meaning as they were, uh, from a certain moment on, I just couldn't believe that a man as seasoned as Kerry would, you know, try to ram his head through the same brick wall that everybody already, you know, had bloodied their noses on. Uh, because there is an alternative, an alternative that I have uh, been one of the proponents of for, for many, many years, which is to engage with uh, the Arab League Peace Initiative because there is absolutely no way in which purely bilateral uh, negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians are going to lead anywhere. If you want, I can explain in quite detail, so, some detail why. Why don't you uh, summarize the, the Arab League Peace Initiative, which is now years old, right, and gets revived every once in a while as a possibility, I guess. Okay, let, let me you know, first... Okay, it started in 2002 as the Saudi uh, uh, Peace Initiative, which uh, of which, by the way, Tom Friedman the, from the New York Times claims pretty much to have been the inventor because he kind of threw it in the air uh, in a conversation with the royal family and though they picked up the, uh, the challenge, which well, he said, why don't you come to Jerusalem and say, look, uh, well, all of... All, all of the Arab world will recognize Israel if Israel uh, goes, um, retreats to the 1967 borders. It was then ratified by the whole Arab League, and um, it is basically, and has been widened to include not only all Arab countries, but uh, also basically all major Muslim countries except for Iran. Uh, so Israel would basically get full diplomatic relationships uh, uh, and normalized relations with all of the Muslim world. Uh, now, the problem is, first of all, it's absolutely fascinating. I'm part of an organization that is uh, uh, fully devoted to try to engage with that initiative, and we can't even get Israelis to be aware of it. Had, we've pumped a load of money into trying to get Israelis to get to to be aware of it. Still, eighty eight percent of Israelis don't even know what it, that it exists or what it is. I mean, it would have to be modified somewhat, right? I mean, Israel is not going to withdraw entirely to the nineteen sixty seven borders, uh, given the uh, given the existence of these large settlements, right? Yeah, the uh, Arab League Peace Initiative has meanwhile been modified to include what is agreed, basically agreed upon between Israelis and Palestinians, that there will be land swaps between those large settlement blocks that, that are very close to uh, the original armistice lines, and uh, so that's been included in the uh, in the um, uh, in the Arab League Peace Initiative. There are some problems with it, and one of the things that Israelis, major Israeli policymakers, uh, say is, "Look, we can't, don't, 
we, we would engage with it as a basis for uh, negotiation, not as a take it or leave it, or leave it proposition, for example, because it includes Israel withdrawing from the Golan. In the current state of Syria, there is no, no prime minister, left-leaning as he may be, uh, who would even think of withdrawing from the Golan. We have, de facto, we have ISIS, uh, which is a, an Al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, uh, terrorist group, which has been highly active in, uh, in, uh, in the fighting in Syria and in Iraq. Uh, we've had them literally across the border, and nobody's going to let them any closer to uh, Israeli population centers. But let, let me for, uh, get clear on the difference between this and what carries proposing of course what 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 you know the standard proposal for a two state solution includes what we've talked about withdrawal to 67 borders except with land swap so the palestinians yeah. would get chunks of uh israel proper equivalent to the chunks of you know palestine that are left under settlement um but and 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 that never happens is the idea that from Israel's point of view, there would now be the added inducement of diplomatic recognition. So it would be kind of a two-state solution with with additional benefits from... With additional benefits, but I'll tell you why it's the only way to go anyway. Um, what uh, You see, the, one of the major bones of, bones of contention, which I think in the American media is often underplayed, is the crucial importance that the right of return of, uh, for the refugees has for the Palestinians. Now, that is a very interesting situation because there is no precedent for the... When we talk about refugees, we talk about people who've actually been uh, forced to flee elsewhere. Uh, we're talking about people who are now often the fourth and sometimes even the fifth generation of people uh, of Palestinians who were uh, who were expelled from their homes in 1948. That's uh, 67 uh, years ago. It's going uh, to be 68 soon. Um, so, um, and we're talking at this point about five to six million people. And one now for Israel, uh, the uh, the right of return is a no is a no-brainer in the, in the simple sense that the idea that these people could return within the borders of pre-1967 Israel is basically means to abolish the state of Israel. Um, because we would have 6 million um, or 5 million uh, uh, Palestinians, uh, which is basically the number of Jews here, and that would be the end of... So uh, abolish uh, it as a, as a Jewish state, certainly, yes. Not only that, I mean, this display, I mean, it's, it's complete, no, nobody can fathom how, how you would do this, because display, people forget that all of Israel is a little bit less than the size of New Jersey, okay? Um, people don't even understand how small this place is, and two-thirds of it is basically uninhabitable desert. Uh, now, one of the points is that only the Arab League Peace Initiative uh, would do two things, or it would have to be a multilateral agreement because it would have to include that most of those so-called refugees, uh, I'm saying so-called not because they're not part of families that were uh, expelled, but because uh, they're obviously not refugees in any... Uh, they're not the people who actually fled. Yeah. Uh, would be uh, would be nationalized by the countries they live in, or a uh, proposition that came up that uh, was flooded among the, uh, for about a week. It was in the press and then disappeared. It wasn't supposed to uh, reach the press to begin with. Uh, Jordan proposed the state of Jordan proposed to uh, accept all of these refugees who are not already in Jordan or in the Palestinian territories. And nationalize them, and uh, in, if they were, if the Jordanian Kingdom would get something like fifty-five billion dollars in recompensation in order to be able to build the infrastructure uh, to uh, basically double, more than double its population. So there's an added incentive. The, the Arab League proposal gives Israel 
an added incentive uh, of, of diplomatic recognition, but also, in your view, solves the right of return problem in principle, because you think the Palestinians would settle for uh, attaining full rights in the in the countries they're living in, which many of them don't have. There are these refugee camps in these various Arab countries yeah. uh, where uh, the Palestinians don't have full citizenship in the countries they're living in. Um, yes, I, I have to correct you on one point. When you say Israeli uh, the Palestinians would basically settle for that, um, that is not a, a, a foreground conclusion at all. One of the things that people are not aware of is that within Palestinian society, uh, there are enormous rifts about this because there are there is a sizable, very sizable uh, part of the Palestinian uh, people, and th that does not only include people who live with in the West Bank and in Gaza, who would not accept that, who say that the goal of Palestinian nationhood is. Uh, to get the gain, get to gain the right of return, and to abolish the state of Israel as a Jewish state, uh, which is one of the reasons why Netanyahu uh, keeps making this somewhat strange-sounding uh, uh, demand that Palestinians should accept Israel as a Jewish state. There's a more cynical explanation for why he keeps demanding that, but never mind. Go ahead. There is a, there is a more cynical explanation that uh, that he uh, that because they can't do it for political reasons, and so it's a it's a yeah, just a deal that, stopper. Well, look, uh, you know, one of the things is I very much belong to the liberal uh, camp, but the liberal camp tends to skip the facts that they don't like. He might as well say, if it's so unimportant, what on earth does Abbas care uh, whether... Uh, well, no, uh, but there is an answer. And, you know, I actually heard this from your fellow uh, Israeli liberal, uh, Gershom Gorenberg, when he was uh, here. I was having coffee with him. This was years ago. And he said, for example, it is viewed for, for, for them to say, okay, Israel is a Jewish state is viewed as a betrayal of those Palestinians who are living in Israel now, as, as, a, as an affirmation of their marginalization. So that's one of the reasons there's a political problem with Abbas saying it that doesn't have to do with, is you know, one, maybe's fear about why he wouldn't say it. That is one explanation. The second explanation is... And uh, look, there, there, there is some research that points in that direction, and there's some research that points in the other direction. There is also the uh, uh, there is also there is a lot of research that points in the direction that for many Palestinians, though in the long run, the idea is still that in the end, uh, Israel will also be, the, the pre-1967 Israel will also be become a binational state with a, with, with a Palestinian majority. Uh, I think that's, it's just conveniently, uh, see, let me, let me give you a piece of information that uh, you might find interesting. I've had a very long conversation with one of the leading, uh, leading Islamic scholars in Israel who was very close to our funds and who spent the last three days uh, before the cursed uh, Camp David summit in the year 2000 in the Mukata, in the place where Arafat was, uh, uh, was living at the time in Ramallah. And he told me and uh, two other people who were present that Arafat couldn't sleep and, you know, he would toss around and, and keep repeating, why are they dragging me there? I've told them time and again, I cannot come back without the right of return. This is a doomed uh, enterprise to begin with. And it's something that I partially say in the mode of mea culpa, because many um, researchers who focus on Palestinian uh, culture and politics kept telling us at the time Look, you on the left simply assume that the Palestinians want what you say they are supposed to want, but you're not listening to what's going on in, in, the, in their internal discourse. And that's what I'm also telling you, Bob. I think it's just too convenient to uh, say, look, the Palestinians are clearly uh, and fully uh, committed to this. You see, one of the reasons uh, Israelis are so skeptical is that Hamas, of course, has always made very clear that for them, uh, abolishing the state of Israel 
is the major goal, whether by force or by other means. And uh, so you have a very sizable part of Palestinian society that is not committed to the two-state solution. I think the majority, from what we know from research, between 60 and 70 percent of Palestinians are in favor of the uh, two-state solution. The same holds true for Israelis. This, it's, it's, it's a mirror image. But you have a sizable part represented by Hamas in Palest uh, among the Palestinians that isn't. And you have a sizable uh, proportion, about 25 percent, of Israelis were committed to the uh, idea or the ideal or the dream of the greater land of Israel. That includes the biblically important parts, which are all on the West Bank. Right. And the deal of a two-state solution is that you would have to just hope that the minorities on both sides, with their extreme aspirations, would slowly reconcile themselves to the deal. You're not going to get them to agree, you know, in advance, you know, those sides and and it may be that as a political accommodation, um, in order to get the deal, somebody like Abbas has to avoid saying uh, something that's going to drive the extremists nuts. And that is, that is you know, uh, uh, that you'd like to hear. But uh, uh, to me, I, I, I just, I'm sorry, but I do buy the, the cynical explanation. This is not something that historically Israel had insisted on. Um, it's not something that any other state does. America doesn't recognize Israel as a Jewish state. It just recognizes it as a nation, like like everyone else. So, so you're asking the Palestinians to uh, to do something that nobody else is asked to do. I understand you might say, well, we have reasons to be suspicious, but it just it just uh, you know I, I just uh, I I don't think it's a uh, well I just don't think it's in Israel's self interest to make this demand because I understand why it's not going to be fulfilled. <laughs> And in the long run, I think Israel really needs a deal. But, uh, but uh, we're, we're at cross point purposes here. I'm trying to explain why Bibi does what he does. I'm not endorsing this. Okay. Uh, I am ex also explaining why it is a little bit less weird and irrational than it might sound. Because many Israelis are concerned. And by the way, that includes some people who might not know are fully could have committed to the two-state solution, senior members of the uh, of the of the intelligence community, who basically are all leaning towards the two-state two, two, two solution. I don't know whether you've seen uh, the uh, documentary "The Gatekeepers," in which uh, uh, it's I, I warmly recommend uh, watching it. The, the um, uh, director is called the Dead Moray, and excuse me, Dro Moray. And uh, it is composed of interviews with the last six chiefs of the Shin Bet, which is, uh, it, which is the internal security apparatus of Israel. And all of them make very clear that they're committed to the two-state solution. So we're not talking about the question of whether Israel needs a deal or not. There, uh, you and I are completely on the same side. I think it is uh, sometimes... Uh, just too convenient to skip the complexities of it. Yeah, I mean, I, we, what we were arguing about was our interpretation of why Bibi is saying this. And I, I would just say the grounds for my cynical interpretation <laughs> include the following. That, like, you're right, back in, in, in 2000 or whenever, uh, Arafat was not ready for a deal because he wasn't ready to surrender true right of return, or at least say he was surrendering true right of return. At the same time, you know, and back then, Israel wasn't demanding to be recognized as a Jewish state. Now you get a boss who, so far as we can tell, would be much more accommodating on the right of return thing than Arafat. He wasn't saying, why are you dragging me here, kicking and screaming, I can't do right of return. And suddenly, Israel throws in this whole new deal oh, stopper, oh, oh, you know, oh, that, that uh, and, oh, and so, yeah, oh, I'm a little cynical. Let, let, me, let, me, let me first deal with my interpretation of it. It really is, okay? I was trying to explain, I think it's just... It's kind of become so, uh, there is a standard liberal discourse in which Israel is just being bashed for not moving towards a two-state solution that, just, that simply skips the complexities, okay? That simply skips the complexity. For example, you know, there's this thing about Israel needing security control over the Jordan Valley. Now, let me give you a very concrete reason for that. Um, you have a growing contingent of Al-Qaeda-associated fighters uh, in Syria. 
that through Jordan very easily can get into the West Bank. We have indication that quite a few of them are already there. And uh, if Israel does not have a way to make sure that that this infiltration doesn't become a mass phenomenon, uh, it needs some kind of control over those uh, over those crossings. And I, you know, you, you know, we've known each other for a while, and you know my positions, and you know how deeply I'm committed to the two-state solution. In terms of the security arrangements, this is going to be a pretty complex matter. You see, I have, uh, I may, again, I may or may not have to run into the shelter in, uh, in in the next few minutes, but, you know, from Gaza, they have rather few rockets that, that can reach uh, Tel Aviv. Um, I can, you know, from, from high, if you live in the 7th or 8th floor in Tel Aviv, you can see parts of the Judean hills that would, be, would belong to Palestine, Belong to uh, if it, uh, Israel moves back to 1967, and I can show you places very easily. I just I flew in tonight uh, from from Rome, and I can show you the places where you know somebody can just sit down very quietly, have a, have a cigarette, and wait for the Stinger missile and take down any jet that comes in to Ben Gurion, which is which is Israel's major international, actually really only real international airport, uh, you know, because it would be on the height of one kilometer. It, it, you, don't even, you don't have to be much of a specialist to do that. These are not paranoid fantasies. These are realities. That is one of the things I really want to make clear, because I sometimes get somewhat aggravated by those who think, okay, you guys always have those worst-case scenarios. These are not worst-case scenarios. We've, we've had all of them. We've had attempts to do that. These are not inventions. I still think that Israel needs to take that risk because otherwise it doesn't have a future as a democratic state, and I don't see how it can... Uh, I don't want it to be anything else. I wouldn't be able to live here if, if it were different, and I think it has no choice. To say that it's so trivial and so easy is simply, you know, to, take, to, to do what I call the standard leftist uh, mistake, which is like, in a rational world, everything would just fall into place, and right. everything would be just and easy. It right. is. No, I, ta- I take the point. I would say, um, well, first of all, on, on the issue of border security, I don't know what the final... You, there was this article in Haaretz, which you probably read, uh, by, what's his name, David Barak, something David, uh, anyway, uh, about the kind of what seems to have been the state of play of negotiations at the end, um, and I don't know exactly what they were in border security. I know Abbas has said he's fine with some kind of NATO presence or something. Israel wants to have an Israeli presence. So anyway, that's in contention. Who would be guarding the border? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say... You're, mis- you're, you're not understanding this. This is not about the border. We're talking about a perimeter... Right. Of 120 kilometers, uh, there is a, with the, Jordan. East, the eastern with, with Jordan, but also on the western side. Okay, how, for example, are, do you make sure that basically Israel's Israel could be cut off from the from the world just by one stinger missile? You have to understand if one international jet is being shot down, Israel is disconnected from the okay, world. Okay, my, my point is that that I don't think the Palestinians have rejected all forms of of of. of no, no, all of this has been on the table. Right. And there but, are but, 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 but let me say one other thing. From their point of view, as I understand it. These deals, the proposals never envision an end to that situation, even a conditional end to that situation. So from the Palestinian point of view, you're calling it a two-state solution, and yet Palestine can't control its borders, can't control its airspace, can't have a meaningful army. These are things we actually traditionally associate with states. And there is no contemplation in these deals, as I understand it, of ever letting Palestinian, as they would see it, out of the cave. So... And you've got to understand that that's not an easy deal for them to sell to their people, that they're calling us a state, but we're really not. Right? I mean, you, you understand that, that from their point of view, that's what's but look, happening. Let me tell you something very simple. I, again, my position, I say that given all these difficulties, for moral, political, and prudential reasons, I see no alternative to the two-state solution. Okay? 
I'm not trying to play the game of Israel's rights that basically takes all these reasons in order to say we have to annex most of the West Bank or we have to drive out the Palestinians or we have to, or any, any, of, the, uh, or any of the other ver uh, variations. I, I'm, I'm not doing that. What I'm saying is, look, the issue is uh, complicated and unfortunately, you're not taking into account one point that is very, very crucial. You see, we say, for example, when we talk about the Arab League Peace Initiative, um, since the onset of the so-called Arab Spring, we're in a situation in which half of the Arab world, you wouldn't even know exactly who the states are. We do not know who in five, what states there will be in, 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 in another... Iraq is widely predicted to fall into uh, for, to to fall into probably three states. Syria is widely expected to uh, fall apart. Uh, Libya is or de facto has de facto fallen apart. So uh, when we talk about the Arab League, we don't even know who who its members are and which of these members might be Salafist states that uh, would not at all uh, uh, agree with that. And all of it is becoming, it's actually becoming worse and without anything that has to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, okay? The fact that the uh, Sunni, uh, that, uh, you know, most of the Shiites have been uh, seen as the problem, the Shiites at this point are the small problem, the radicalization of the Sunni uh, Arabs are, is, is the thing that really worries the world, including the United States at this point. No, and Israel lives within that context. No, I understand, so, I think, pretty well the, the various factors that give rise to a feeling of profound insecurity in Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the question of whether it's in some cases exaggerated is one I'm not really qualified to argue in depth because I would have to know more about the region. But I would j just leave all that aside. Do you understand why, from the Palestinians' point of view, What's being offered conventionally, they might say, well, wait, this isn't even a state in the sense that states are normally states. If we can never, ever control our airspace or our borders, I mean, do you just acknowledge, well, well, okay, we have our point of view. We're profoundly insecure. They have their point of view. They would like a minim minimum of dignity. Do you understand that that's kind of not a highly aberrant way for them to look at it? Let's take it one minute. First of all, uh, in most of those agreements, people what is spoken about is that the state will be demilitarized, and that at some point those security uh, uh, those security arrangements will change. That's good, now, if true. If true, okay. Uh, you live. You are a citizen of a country that, for one terror attack, has has, has invaded two countries, has killed. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people has is doing about the number of targeted assassinations a month more than Israel has done in its whole history. Okay, so before being lectured by even American liberals uh, on uh, look, why aren't you a little bit more flexible about that when the United States obviously has never been existentially endangered? And is you know a, uh, as large as it is and as impenetrable as it is. So uh, uh, when we talk about are, are Israel the concerns of Israelis real or not, the answer is yes. And I uh, well, they're definitely real, uh, but it's but it's but I don't think it's crazy to say that that reasonable people can argue about whether they're exaggerated. I'm not even uh, taking a position right now. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, t I'm taking a position. I know, I know, but you're not arguing with anybody because I'm not. Tell you, my position is that fully taking into account security risks, and I think that Israel ha does have to take into account severe risks in this respect, Israel has to move towards a two state solution. What I'm saying is this is completely non trivial, and it's a little bit tiring of being lectured. Of, it's but, so but easy. Carlo, come on. I mean, first of all, I'm not lecturing you. That's, that's, not a re that's not a reasonable way to describe what's happening oh, here. And I'm secondly... That that's what you do. But you don't know how, what I get. You, uh, you, you, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry about this. I think what, what's happening here is that I'm ventilating a certain amount of frustration 
that even I, as you know, as, as a clear proponent of the of of, of the two state solution, I'm often told like everything is so easy and obvious, and why don't you guys get there? So what I keep telling them, it's neither easy nor nor obvious, and what I have to do as not just a political commentator, but also part of two movements that actively try to get Israelis to endorse this, we have to explain to them why they have to take very tangible risks because we think it's essential for Israel's future. It's not easy. Okay? The fact that Israel's right, you see, one of the things that were, were the, 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 pro, the original sin of Israel's right-wingers is that most of the world at this point does not take the fears of ordinary Israelis serious because they're being manipulatively used by the right to, uh, for, uh, to justify, for example, settlement construction, which of course has absolutely nothing to do with Israel's real security needs. None of these settlements contribute in any way to, the pro uh, to solving the problems that we're talking about. And then correctly, you know, many people, the moment they hear we're afraid and we have, really, we have problems, they say, okay, we know, we know you're ploy by now, because what you do is you say we're afraid, and then you build, a, build another 1,500 uh, uh, apartments in, in, in the West Bank, something which infuriates me even more than it infuriates you, because it basically ruins my future here. And we were on the same side on this part. But what I'm saying is, you know, if, if you talk to run-of-the-mill ordinary Israelis, most of them really do not want the West Bank. All they want is peace and quiet and make sure their kids can get to school on the bus without being blown up. Right. That's all they want. Well, briefly, on the point you made about America being lectured by uh, people who live in a country that overreact 9-11, I, I agreed with you when I was in and when we saw each other in Israel, Israel's certainly not behaving more irrationally than America behaved after 9-11. Now, in defense of myself, I would say I was one of the early in America, I was arguing that we were behaving irrationally. I was against the Iraq war, and I really worked hard to try to get Americans, well, to the extent that I have any influence, which is quite limited, but, uh, but in things I've written, I've worked hard to try to get Americans to appreciate the perspective of the people that that were you know that were not that I think whose perspective I think were not appreciating. So this is a game I always play when I say do you at least acknowledge that the Palestinians see X, Y, and Z. Now the other thing I'd say is I can understand how uh, you know you would be sensitive to well criticism from America or anywhere else. I would assure you that it's most Americans. It's it, it's much the, the criticism. Uh, I, it's, it's it's been a little bit unfair because not only am I not did I not mean criticism that's voiced by you, but most of this criticism is actually coming less from uh, the U.S. except from rather that's what I was going to say African circles, but it is rather strong from Europe, Europe. Uh, uh, where the, a certain type of left and I'm actually so associated with in certain ways, uh, is often, you know, um, speaking in ways that uh, were, you know, where, where the veneer of anti-Israel sentiment is, 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 is or the veneer of, of criticism of certain policies clearly masks uh, the idea that Israel is kind of, all of Israel is a mistake that it shouldn't be there to begin with. Um, and I apologize if uh, if no no, uh, I, and I apologize. Come I your apologize way. if I if I overreacted. I just couldn't imagine who else you were thinking was lecturing you at the moment. Um, the the the. Uh, but what I was going to say, we agree apparently. In America, there's not all that much criticism of Israel historically. That's starting to change a little, though, and I'm wondering. What you think about that? I mean, you know, the the Presbyterian Church just voted to divest yeah. themselves of people who invest in Israel or something. This no, be, not in Israel. In, in the settlements, in, in, in the occupied territory. Yeah. Or, well, three companies that they say abet the occupation: Caterpillar, IBM, and somebody else. That yeah. that's what it was. So, um, yeah. It, so that isn't part of BDS proper, the boycott, divestment, sanctions. I would say in the traditional sense, but that is something you're hearing more about. 
Um, and, you know, interestingly, the current episode in Israel seems to me, if, if anything, to be amping up the criticism a little. You certainly wouldn't have thought this when it started out that these Israeli teenagers had been abducted, right? You wouldn't see how that would lead to, to any greater criticism of Israel. As it's played out, um, you know, I, I, you know with, with the, in particular, with the, with the killing of the, of the Palestinian, and there was this thing that didn't get a lot of attention, but as you probably know, the cousin of the Palestinian who was killed, who was apparently videotaped being beaten by police who, who didn't need to beat him any further to subdue him, and who turns out to be Palestinian-American, that's gotten a little attention. Um, and and I, I'm wondering if you sense that, for some time now, anyway, the climate of opinion is actually shifting in a way that's more critical of Israel. Yeah, of course it, it would is. be all the more reason, I guess, in theory, to... To, to, to of get course, a... let, let me now let, let, let me say something that you might uh, be surprised about. I am very strongly against uh, boycott of uh, divestment and sanction uh, uh, against Israel. I have publicly and privately, you know, people like uh, Khalid, uh, uh, Rashid Khalidi and Judith Butler, who have been uh, who have argued for academic boycotts. I've told them personally and on paper, and I'm friendly terms with both of them, that as long as they receive salaries from their universities that provide technology for targeted killings, I will not be lectured by them on the question whether uh, Israel's universities uh, contribute to the, uh, to the um, uh, occupation. Now, I make a very clear distinction. I think that... Uh, any uh, any uh, group that decides not to fund some something that is located in the West Bank, which according to international law, actually according to Israeli law, is not Israel. Israel has always strenuously avoided annexing any of the West Bank because it is aware of the repercussions. Okay, I don't think that's. That's BDS of Israel. I think that's a legitimate point of view. Uh, I think that when Europeans say, we want to know whether a product comes from Israel or whether it comes from the West Bank, I think that it's absolutely legitimate. I think it doesn't infringe on Israel's right to exist or Israel's legitimacy per se. It is an expression of uh, non not accepting Israel's policies to, uh, in the West Bank, and I don't think, and I think it, this, as long as this, this, this differentiation is made very clearly, um, I see, I, I think, I, I can see no way of criticizing morally or intellectually why an organization uh, that supports Israel but is unwilling to cooperate with the occupation, uh, I'm perfectly fine with that. Now, obviously, this is building up, and it is, by the way, it does have a certain impact on it in Israel. Because I think, um, let me go back once again, you know, there's the noise of official politics and the media war. And then there is what we know of re from research on ordinary Israelis. Once again, ordinary Israelis are not interested in the greater land of Israel. Ordinary Israelis are not interested in ruling the Palestinians. Ordinary Israelis want to know that they can live their lives and be safe. That's all they want. The question is, for them, can they trust the Palestinians, yes or no? And one of the things that has been happening is that most Israelis, that again we know very well from research, um, have come to the point where they so feel so helpless about the question whether this is going anywhere that they don't want to think about it anymore. And some of them say, well, you know, if this occupation has been going on for 47 years and we've survived, so let's let it just continue. And I think that in this respect, um, when clear friends of Israel uh, certainly the U.S., but also, let's uh, say, when uh, when uh, Dutch uh, pension funds said we're no longer going to invest in Israeli companies that have holdings in the in uh, uh, in the West Bank, when things like that happen, and Israelis realize, ah, wait a moment, 
the status quo of 47 years cannot be maintained in the long run, that does have a certain impact. That does have a certain impact. Um, so, yes, uh, clearly, um, the, the fact that Bibi has, Netanyahu has been extremely cynical. Here, of course, I agree with you. He's been playing both sides. Officially, he's been striving towards a two-state solution, but trying not to rupture his, all, uh, his alliance with the settlers. Um, that, of course, gradually more and more infuriates the Western world. And uh, it will... One of the things we're worried about is that Israel obviously will be paying a progressively heavier price for that. And there were leaks coming out of the U.S. negotiating team after the talks collapsed, basically blaming Israel more than the Palestinians. Um, and I think they were. I think most people thought that was Martin Indyk himself uh, who was who was doing that. Um, I, you know, they they and, and Kerry has said some things. Kerry used the word apartheid and then kind of half took it back and so on. So there is some of that criticism coming. But a question I would have, and, and I mean, I will say, you know, in my view, again, you know, BB wasn't, I don't, I don't know how serious it was on the Palestinian side. I don't think it was that serious on BB's side. I mean, for example, one thing that's come out is he has not even agreed to the principle of one-to-one -one land swaps. He finally agreed to land swaps, but wouldn't specify a ratio. And, and I'm like, well, if it's not one-to-one, -one, I mean, anything else is an insult. You know, what other, what other kind of land swap is there? But, but anyway, leaving that aside, my question is, should we really be blaming Bibi, or is his coalition just a reflection of where Israeli politics is and is going to be, right? I mean, there is, there is that argument that, okay, maybe his coalition falls, but there's a reason that it's a, that it's a coalition that, by my lights, is a right-wing coalition, because that's where the Israeli people are. And there, there, is, there is that argument, right, that, it, that, that you're really missing the point to blame yeah, Bibi himself answer again is a little bit more complicated. The answer is that uh, we've run, we meaning uh, for example this uh, organization uh, the Israeli Peace Initiative we've been running polls that showed something very interesting an agreement based on the Arab League Peace, Agree uh, uh, a peace Initiative brought by Bibi would get a pretty much a two thirds, uh, uh, two thirds of, uh, of Jewish Israelis would endorse it. If Tzipi Livni or Yaya Lapid or Bouji Herzog, the more left leaning leaders, would bring it, only 15 to 20 percent would endorse it. In other words, uh, what you have is Israelis say, we're willing to go out, but we want to make sure that the guy who signs that agreement is a tough cookie who has Israel's in just in mind. Now, here come, but here comes the punchline. The punchline is that there is that the, I think, the most sophisticated political players in Israeli politics for the last 35 years have been the extreme right that always used the fears of ordinary Israelis to just keep pushing their agenda. And the problem is that Netanyahu who is a very cautious man, which has its upsides, for example. I'm far less, he's not going to do anything like Omer did in 2008 9, uh, of like, you know, uh, shredding Gaza to pieces for a month. Uh, he's much more restrained when it comes to military issues. The problem is he's also very afraid of losing his old time coalition with the settlers. He feels that that's part of his political power base. And so, no, it does not, to return to your question, it does not reflect Israeli society as it is. It reflects a combination between the fears of Israelis and the complexity of Israeli political structure, which gives the extreme right, including the settlers, uh, a leverage that is goes far beyond their actual power in Israeli society. So you can imagine a coalition that would be viable and not include the settlers, and you might get a totally different outcome. Uh, look, uh, Netanyahu and here is his weakness, and here is my major criticism towards it. Netanyahu had the option for a different coalition. He, he could, instead of bringing in Bennett, he could have brought in Labour. He would have had even a, a, an even larger coalition. 
uh, and he could have gone, uh, and he wouldn't have uh, had in an inner internal opposition that's that strong to move towards peace, and he didn't do that. Okay, so it is. It is not. Be, look, I think uh, it is. You know, the more we know about decision making processes and uh, about uh, of political leaders, you know, people like you and me, where we decide whether to buy this new car or not buy this new car, uh, we often make, you know, at the last minute we suddenly change our minds and it's not really rational. For some reason, we expect people who are at the helm of states not to be human. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is, it's not that BB has that clear, you know, this clear, cynical ploy, I'm going to fool the whole world, etc., etc. He is a tactician trying to stay alive. He has his moments in which he feels there is no way except to go for the two-state solution. And then when it comes to the critical moments, he says, oh my God, this is the end of my political career because I'm going to lose my right-wing constituency. We tend to ascribe a level of level-headedness, rationality, and decisiveness to political uh, um, to political leaders that is simply completely uh, unrealistic. Look, I've been in political campaigns. I see how I've seen from up close how decisions that are absolutely critical are made. They're made in no, they're not made in, in, in a more rational manner than you and I decide on where to have dinner at best, buy our car or buy a house at best. Uh, you know, we're, if we're even there, as we both know, and probably our listeners know, or view, viewers know, uh, we make our decisions based on completely rational factors. So let me, I mean, we're, we're, uh approaching an hour, I guess we uh, should call it quit soon, but let me let me ask you, um, uh, well, well, two questions. I mean, first of all, I would like to ask you, you are a clinical psychologist. When you think about, on the one hand, the Palestinians who uh, abducted and killed those teenagers, and on the other hand, the Israelis who abducted and killed the Palestinian, um, I guess two things. Do you think that fundamentally, at some level, what's going on in their heads is the same, you know, it's in the heads of the Palestinians, in the heads of the Israelis, and also relatedly, maybe this is asking too much, but, but is it, is it just kind of normal human psychology under extreme circumstances, or is it pathology in the purest sense, like something's just gone wrong with the human machine, if you know what I mean? Okay, may I remind you of the two good old experiments that can no longer be run nowadays. Stanford Prison Experiment and... Phil Zimbardo and the Milgram Experiment pre both predict that you and I, you know, nice, academically educated, uh, left-leaning people are far more likely to behave like pigs if we are uh, given the role to be prison guards and to give shocks that might be life-threatening if we're being induced to do so by a nice-looking man and donning a white uh, uh, lab, lab coat that tells us how, it's important, how important it is to science. In other words, you know, I think... Uh, let me answer you not as a clinical psychologist because I think it's not, there's nothing clinical there. Let me answer you with Hannah Arendt. You know, Hannah Arendt's um, famous formulation of the banality of evil. She primarily meant how, you know, people are just obedient, which is the Milgram thing. There's another thing that's also very, very banal, which is that there is a level of rage that all of us are capable of. Hope, I, you know, ho I hope that you and I and... All of, us, all of those we love will never be in a situation where we experience the level of rage where we are willing to kill. And I have no doubt that you can be brought to it. I have no doubt that I can be brought of it. And, you know, sitting in, uh, in, in the safe environment of our studies and saying, oh my God, this couldn't happen to me, is given the knowledge we have about the human psyche, just a form of denial. 
and leaving rage per se aside, the ability to, I don't know, if, you know, dehumanize is the common word, but I almost don't want to use that because I think we are actually designed by natural selection to be able to think of groups of human beings like this. You know, mm -hmm. once you define them as the the implacable enemy, um, you you uh, well, you don't care what happens to them. well, you do care what happens to them. You want bad things to happen to them, and it just it's a fundamental. You interpret all their behavior differently, and I think that we all struggle with on a daily basis. I mean, just in the sense of like, you know, not listening to our ideological opponents in the way we would listen to allies not taking the same pains to, to understand what they're actually thinking. So, so I think, you know, anyway, we're on the same page. I think this is unfortunately not pathology in the strict sense so much as human, human behavior, you know, human, human beings working in a sense as designed under extreme circumstances, which is a horrible thing to even say. As you say, as you say and since you know evolutionary psychology very well, we we're all programmed to have the program, the option, the, uh, the, the, uh, the app, we would say nowadays, of seeing the outgroup as inferior, as non-human, as killable, they can be maimed, they can be eaten, uh, because now we d just defend our own group. And that is part, similar, uh, and to return to Hannah Arendt, uh, she wrote to Gershom Scholem, the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah researcher, uh, but evil is banal. What is deep and interesting is goodness. Because what, is, what I, at this point, find much more fascinating is the question is, how does civilization make it possible that most of us, most of the time, behave in a civilized manner? Quite unfortunately, the, the, the Middle East has the strong tendency to get the archaic uh, parts of our uh, biological inheritance out of many of us uh, more than the civilized part. Well, we've seen we've seen a certain amount of it in America, I must say. And again, I think we all, in an incremental way, you know, fall prey to it to some extent. The um, so final quick question, uh, just you know, I think we agree that the odds are not great that we're going to see a two-state solution or the your the, the Arab League thing happen. Um, if not, where does this go? I mean, where does it, how does this end, if ever? I mean, there is, again, the view that, well, you can just, as they say, keep mowing the lawn, you know, every five years decimate Hamas's infrastructure or whatever and keep the, keep the, the, the opposition at bay in some sense. But what is your view of where this goes if there is no solution? Uh, are you asking me as a uh, political commentator or as a prophet? <laughs> uh, well, I guess both, because I, I think I want you to take account of the, uh, the politics. I, see, I think I do. Uh, well, I can uh, I can tell you that if we don't get a solution, this is going to get worse and worse and worse. And this is why I invest a sizable amount of my time doing stuff that I don't not, don't get a cent for. Uh, uh, in order to convince Israelis to see that this is the only way out. And uh, knowing that our chances of success in doing so are relatively slim, because the alternative is that, you know, it'll look more and more like uh, um, the aftermath of the falling apart of Yugoslavia. And um, I have no clue what, uh, you know, we shouldn't forget one thing, you know, we tend to zoom in on the on the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict. There are about 37 conflicts of that sort and length and are much bloodier than that and simply do not end. And uh, my fear is exactly that uh, if we don't move forward, as you say, we'll have that same cycle again and again and again. We got through this conversation without my having to go to, a, uh, to, to the shelter, but... Um, um, my fear is that in the next five or ten years, time and again, the, the moment will come where I will have to do so. Okay, well, let's hope, let's hope that it was a good omen that we got through an hour without an air raid siren. Um, <laughs> and I'm grasping for straws here. Uh, yeah, that's fine. The, believe me, I, I sometimes, you know, uh, it's not, uh, I have lately, you know, uh, many of my readers 
keep telling me, look, you're, you're becoming more and more pessimistic. And I tell them, you know, you know what a pessimist is? It's, a, it's an optimist who's gained some experience. Uh, and I, 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 you know, I look for straws of hope as much as you do because... Uh, probably it's, more. Uh, probably more. That's good. You're, you're, you're more highly motivated to look for them, uh, I would say, yes. uh, given where you are. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Carl. It's been very illuminating. Uh, maybe, maybe someday we'll have one of these conversations under uh, under less disturbing circumstances. I really hope so. Thanks for having me again. Okay, take care. Take care. Bye.